So we'll continue on talking about uh, dynamic programming. Uh, just wanted to go over a topic I think we've talked about before is greedy methods, and then we'll cover the knapsack problem. There's different versions of the knapsack problem. And then Huffman code, which is also uh, an interesting way of solving a dynamic programming problem. So the first one, the first problem we'll look at, the instance is going to be, we have an operating system, and we have three jobs in our system. They have to run sequentially. So it's kind of like going to a supermarket and bringing your shopping wagon, um, and you go to the cashier and everyone lines up, and you finish your job, uh, you finish your job when the cashier is done with you, and then the next person goes after that. So we have three customers or jobs on our computer system. The first one will take five seconds to complete. The second one will take ten seconds to complete. And the third one will take three seconds to complete. And let's say they all arrived at the same time. So what we're going to try to do is figure out which one should we let go first and then second and third. So we're going to try to come up with a batting order for what's the best way to let these jobs proceed. And we want to do it with our goal is to have the amount of time that a job spends in the system, the average amount of time, to be as small as possible. Okay. Now, hopefully, um, you, the answer hit you right away. <laughs> hopefully, you know, right away you just said, let the shortest job go first, and then the second shortest, and the third one. And that's kind of the idea when you go to a supermarket and they have... Uh, you know, like an express line, six items or less, 12 items or less. They're basically trying to get the processes that would be the quickest to get out the door to get out quicker. But suppose we didn't know that. One way to pretty much solve any computer problem is to take every possible combination of input, evaluate it, and then take the best answer. That'll always work. The problem with that approach is uh, how long it takes to do that. But let's say we did that method. So suppose we said we're going to use the batting order of job one goes first, then job two goes second, and then job three goes third. Suppose we decided to do that. Well, when would the first one finish? Well, the first one we said takes five seconds, so it'll be done in five seconds. The second one would have to wait behind the first one, and then the second one would run. So it'll take five seconds of waiting plus 10 seconds to actually do the second job. So that would finish at time is 15. The third job would have to wait for the first one to finish, then wait for the second one to finish, and then would run. So that would finish at uh, 18 seconds later. 5 plus 10 plus 3 is 18. So it would take 18 seconds for the third job. From the moment it entered our system to the moment it exited would be 18 seconds. So our goal is to minimize the total of these. Or you could even think of it as, you know, minimize the average, which would be the total of these divided by 3. So the total time in the system would be 38 seconds. If we divided this by 3, it would be the average time that each one of these three had in the system. So that's one answer. We consider that batting order. Then we do the next possible batting order, which is 1, then 3, then 2. When we perform the same computation, we say, oh, we get a better answer. Well, if we enumerated every batting order, done this computation every time, we would get all the different batting orders and all their um, total time of our three customers in the system would be 38, 31, 43, 41, 29, and 34. So after we have enumerated all the possible ways we could line up the input, computed the amount of time it all took, then went through all our answers and picked the best one, we'd notice that the optimal answer is uh, an average of 20, uh, 29 seconds total in the system, which has the batting order of 3 goes first, then 1, then 2, which is the shortest job, then the second shortest job, and then the longest job. And hopefully, intuitively, we could have thought right away that should be the answer. So that approach is called the greedy method. The greedy method is basically a method where you look at your data and you say, let me just grab the best thing, let that go first, then whatever I have left over, let grab the best thing there, let that go, until I finally hit the answer. That's generally, you know, what a greedy method is. So um, 
greedy methods, you know, sometimes work and sometimes they don't work. There's a famous problem in the world of computer science. If you Google uh, the knapsack problem, there'll be tons and tons of hits on it. But here's basically uh, the idea. Here's kind of a simple version of it. Suppose we have a knapsack. So that's like, you know, you bring the school bag. You have all your books in your bag. You bring your uh, a knapsack and hold up to 90 pounds of stuff. And if you put in one more pound, like 91 pounds, the bag will rip open and, and you'll lose everything. So 90 is your max, and you can't go over 90. And then suppose we have an endless supply of three different things we can put in this bag. Uh, one thing that weighs 20 pounds and has a value of uh, $10. Uh, item number two weighs 30 pounds and has a value of $27. And then item number three weighs 40 pounds and has a net worth of $40. Okay, so now the question is, what stuff should you put in the bag if your goal is to get as much value in the bag? Not as much weight, as much value. So, now I'm kind of like getting you guys to use the previous answer, the method of the previous answer to solve this one. But does anyone have a, a guess at how you would do this? without kind of, obviously one answer would be to enumerate every combination of organizing the inputs and then taking the best one, but that might take a while. Can you just at a glance, you know, what would you think would be the answer to this question? Any, any idea? I know this is not an easy question. This is, this, like I say, you go on Google, there's be tons and tons of write-ups on it. So uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying you know, you should know the answer to this off the top of your head, but does anyone have an idea? Well, let, let me just, let me do this. Let me throw out some ideas. One thing we could do is we could try to fill up the bag with stuff that takes up the least weight. So that way we have more room for more stuff. You might say, oh, let me just try to, you know, throw in these 20-pound items as much as I can. Um, just throw as many of them in, and then when we get near the end, whatever room we have left, we'll throw in a couple of different items. That could be one approach. Another approach might say, let's throw the, as many of the most valuable items, let's throw as many of them in as we can. And then when we get near the end, we'll find less valuable items to fill up the remainder of the bag. That might work. But does anybody see a, an answer that could be different from that? I'm sorry? Okay. Yeah, so in this case, it turns out that neither one of those might, you know, you might call a greedy algorithm, either taking the least weight thing and stuff in the bag with that, or taking the most valuable thing and stuff in the bag with that. It turns out in this case, and it kind of arranged the numbers so neither one of those methods would work. Um, the best thing to do would be to take a, as many items of number two as you can. So uh, we could take three of them, fit that into a bag that holds 90 pounds, and get 27 times three. As opposed to getting two times 40, which would be $80, we'd end up with uh, $81. And if we filled up the bag with four of these, we'd have $40 and 10 pounds left over and again, we'd be stuck. So it ends up being used as many of item number two as possible. Well, another thought might be, why don't we take the item, not the item that's the smallest in weight, and maybe not the item that's the most in value, but let's take the item that um, has the most value per pound. So that's kind of like when you're at the supermarket and they give the unit price of an item. So it says this is how much the item costs like per pound. So you could kind of compare the big soda bottle to the little soda bottle. The one with the better unit price is the one that's the better deal. So you might think, why don't we take the item with the best per pound price and then fill up the bag with as much of that. Now that would happen to work, that greedy method would happen to work in this case, but it doesn't always work because the bag happened to have exactly 90 pounds, if I gave the bag another 10 more pounds and you stuffed it with item two, you might have been able to, you might have been able to use a, a cup, two of item three and one of item one instead of three of item two and then run out of room with the bag. 
So, um, so just you know, a little bit of a write-up is the goal is uh, for the knapsack problem if we allow fractional parts of it, meaning we can uh, take fractions of it, then we would take the best, the one with the best unit price, and just stuff the bag with that one. That would, of course, make sense. If you can't do that, the problem then becomes we want to summarize the, we want to fill the bag. We, so we want to take the, the value of the items and the weight of the items. We want to maximize that. Uh, I'm sorry, the number of items plus the value times the value of the items. That's the total value in the bag, subject to the fact that the number of items and the weight must be less than the 90 pounds. And we want to find the best answer. So right off the top of your head, you think, well, why don't we enumerate every possible input and then just take the best answer? And that's going to end up having a running time of 2 to the n, because there's 2 to the n different ways that so we can take combinations of the three items and then fill them up to a bag of size 90. And so that's an exponential running time. And we also want to point out in this example the greeting method doesn't work here. So the best answer of 91 uh, of 81 beat the greeting method of 80. So we have to look for a way to solve this um, this type of a problem. Now let me go over an easier version of the problem just to get an appreciation for um, the, this kind of a problem. So let's say we have a knapsack, and the knapsack holds up to 11 pounds. And there are five different items we can put into the knapsack. And this is a restriction that makes the problem a lot easier to solve. And still, we'll, we'll see, it's not so easy. Okay, here we're going to say you can only use one of each item. So it's not an endless supply of the five items. You either get one, one of each, and you have the choice. You could either use it, you could put it in the bag, or not put it in the bag. That'll be your choice. <clears throat> so, the, uh, the first item weighs one pound and has a value of one, let's say, dollar. Item two has, weighs two pounds and has a value of six dollars. Item three uh, weighs five pounds and has eighteen dollars. Right? Item four is six pounds, twenty-two dollars. Item 5 is 7 pounds, 28 dollars. Okay, so our goal is we have a knapsack that can hold 11 pounds. If you go over 11, the bag rips apart and you lose everything. So, the question is, how do we solve this one? So, if we tried the greedy method of put the smallest item in to leave as much room for more stuff, and then we would end up putting... Uh, the first item in, leaving the bag with 10 more pounds of stuff, then the second item in, uh, leaving the bag with 8 more pounds of stuff, then the third item in, leaving the bag with 3 more pounds of stuff, and now we've run out of room. So one greeting method would be to take item 1, 2, and 3, and then stop, because we're out of room. Another greeting method might say, let's put the item with the most value in first, so that would be the last one. Let's put the 20, let's get $28 by putting in item 5. And that eats up 7 of our 11 pounds, leaving 4 pounds left over. We can't put item 4 in. We can't put item 3 in. Well, we can put item 2 in. And that one gives the most value. So we put item 2 in, meaning we've used up 9 pounds of our 11 pounds. And we still have one more pound to go, and we put in item one. So now another answer could be item one, two, and five. And that gives us a total of 28 plus six, 34 plus one, 35. So that's another greedy approach. Let's take the most valuable items and put those in first. Then what if we use the greedy approach where we take the item with the best unit value or the best per pound value? Well, the best per pound value, this would be a dollar a pound. This would be uh, $3 per pound. This would be $3.6 per pound. This would be three point, uh, I don't know, three and two thirds dollars per pound. 
and this one would be four dollars per pound. So this is this has the best unit price. So let's put one of those in, and then you know we work our way back up. After that, it would be well these guys can't fit anymore, <laughs> and we're back to the same answer as before, five plus two plus one. So there's a couple of greedy approaches that we would try, and we get a certain set of answers for this question. But it looks like maybe the best answer would be the 5 plus the 2 plus the 1. Two of our greedy methods came up with that answer. Uh, two out of threes. Two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> um, but anyway, we'll use a dynamic programming approach to solving the problem. And it's basically, we don't know with five items and a, and a bag of size 11, we don't know the best answer right away, but we can answer some questions. We can say if the bag was of size zero, meaning nothing could be put in it, we could solve that one because the answer is we can't put anything in it. If the bag was, can only hold one pound, the question becomes very easy to solve. With one pound, we can only put item one in, and that's it. You can't put these in. It becomes a very easy question. So if I said, what if the bag can hold up to two pounds? That one we can solve easily because with one pound we could put this item in and this one won't fit because we used up one of the two pounds. Or we can put this item in, which means this one won't fit, and we ask ourselves which is bigger, one or six, six is bigger. So if the bag could only hold two, then the smartest thing to do would be put item two in. These items don't fit and we're done. What if the bag was of size three? If the bag was of size 3, then we have a bunch of choices. The smartest thing we could do when the bag was size 1, plus the smartest thing we could do when the bag was size 2, plus the smartest thing we can do when the bag was size 3, and that could be filling it up with 18, or taking the best answer we had before, which was 6 plus the additional room of 1, 6 plus 1. So we'd be comparing 18 versus 7 if the bag could only hold 3 pounds. Once we know all the answers for three pounds, we say now let the bag go to four pounds and we can figure out the answer and, and, and keep doing that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to basically say with five different items and bags, bag capacities from zero up to the answer we actually care about, which is 11, what we're going to do, <laughs> snowing out. Uh, so what we're going to do is this, so we're going to say if, there was, if you're only allowed to use item 1 and the bag sizes can go anywhere from 0 up to 11, what's the smartest thing we could do? Well, if the bag is of size 0, then the most value we could put into the bag is 0. Can't, can't do anything about it. So the best value in the bag would be 0. If the bag increases to size 1, then we have a choice. Put item one at, at, so let me just uh, pretend these last four rows are not here. If the bag capacity is zero and the only item we can choose is item one, no other items are allowed, what's the smartest thing to do? If the bag size is zero, there's nothing we can do about it, we can't put anything in the bag, so the value is zero. If the bag size goes to one, we have a choice. We can either add the item or not add the item. If we, and then we'll take the best of the two choices. If we add the item, then the value in the bag goes to 1. If we don't add the item, then the value stays whatever it was one pound sooner, which was 0. So out of 0 and 1, we take the best answer. At this point, if the bag increased to size 2, 3, 4, whatever, we've taken the item, and so the most value we could put into the bag is 1. So this first row represents the most value we could put into the bag if we're only allowed to use item 1 and the bag had values, weight values, between 0 and 11. Now, with that data, we can calculate the next row. If we are allowed to ch choose item 1 or item 2, okay, we want to make the best move we can. So. If the bag is of size 0, again, we're back to 0. If the bag is of size 1, we have no choice. We can't put this item in it. So we have to take the best answer from the row above us. 
if the bag is of size 2, we now have an option. We can choose this item or we cannot choose this item. It's our option. So let's take the better of the two options. We can put in a value of 6 pounds, which means we use up 2 units of our weight. We could take 6 pounds and then ask ourselves, if, if I took away 2 units of weight, I go to the previous row back 2 units and I can add a 0 to the 6. So 0 plus 6 is 6 pounds. So by adding this item, I'm leaving myself with a bag with no more available weight. And using item 2 in a bag with no weight would be this number 0. So I have a choice, 6 plus 0, or that would mean I'm using this item, or I could just not use this item, which means I take this number, the previous row's number, which is exactly the same, it would be exactly the same if I didn't use the item. So I have a choice, 6 or 1, which is better? So we take 6. So this is a 6. In the next row, if the bag was of size 3, I have a choice. I could use this item, which gives me a value of 6, but I've used up 2 units of weight, so I go to the previous row, back 2 units, and this 1 plus this 6 becomes 7. So 6 plus 1 I'm sorry, 6 plus 1 is 7, so I have a choice. 7 is where I use this item, and 1 is where I don't use this item. So I would decide to use it and get a value of 7. So if I have two items and a bag of size 3, I can get $7 worth of value into the bag. And then, because I can only use these two items and I'm actually using both, this just goes 7, 7, 7, and so on. Now, suppose we go back to the beginning weights of size 0, bags that hold 0, and now we can take item 1 or 2 or 3. So we're just going to compare adding this to the mix as opposed to not adding it and just taking the better of the two answers. So all we're really doing is we're, we're dynamically programming the numbers into this chart. Once we finally get to the last row where we're using all five items, for a bag of size 10, this is going to end up being our answer. So for the third row, uh, where were we? We were on, yeah, the third row. Okay, bag of size 0 is 0. Bag of size 1, this item can't go in, so we just copy the previous row's data. So we're copying, copying, bag of size 3. And so, I'm sorry, for a bag of size 5, the, the weight is 5. So bags up to size 4, we're just copying the data down. When we get to a bag of size 5, we have a choice. We could go 18 plus the previous row 5 units back. So we could do 18 plus 0, or that, that would mean we're using item 3, or we cannot use item 3, which means just take this 7, sorry, this 7, take this 7 and copy it down. So we have a choice, 18 or 7, so we'll pick 18. For this one, we can decide to use this item 3 or not. If we use it, it's 19 plus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 19 plus 1, I'm sorry, 18 plus 1 is 19. So if the bag was of size 6 and we can use items 1, 2, and 3, the best thing we could do is a, a value of 19. For uh, a bag of size 7, we can put in this item that takes up 5 units of weight, get a value of 18, leaving us with 2 more units of weight. So we go look at all previous items with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 3, uh, three units of weight. 5 plus 3 is 8. Yeah, so when the bag is of size 8, we get to 25. So we can get a value of 25 by putting item 1 in, plus item 2, plus item 3, putting all three items in. So all three items in would go along here. So it starts to look like we're building a chart and we're just adding every item. Here's where it gets a little bit interesting. Uh, oh yeah, let me just quickly go over number 4. Row number 4, we have the option of using, so we, 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 can, use, we can put in an item that has a value of 22, which takes up a weight of 6. 
So for the first five bag weights, we're just copying the row before up to here. And five. Now we have an option to put in item number four. If we put in item number four, we get a value of 22. Does 22 beat the best we can do not putting in item four, which is 19, so that beats it? 22 is the best way to use to fill up a bag of size six where we have we can only use the first four items not the fifth item so putting in this item is the best thing to do once the bag hits size six the bag of size seven we could do 22 we can do tw if the bag was of size seven we can do 22 so this would mean we're adding item four 22 plus one, two, three, four, five. We could do 22 plus one, which is 23. Or we could not use this item and take the best answer from the row before it, which is 24. So the reason there's a 24 here and not a 23 is if we had a choice between using, uh, between taking items one, two, three, and four and a knapsack of size seven, it would be smarter to not use this item and instead use these three items. But if the bag was of size six, it would be smarter to use this item to fill up the whole bag. So now you start to realize for different knapsack sizes and different numbers of items, we, we're starting to get different answers. Now when we finish this row, we go this 24 is actually coming from item one, two, and three, not using item four. Then the answer of 28 comes from using this item. This would now be a bag of size eight. We would use this item 22 and then use um, a bag of size two, which is six. 22 plus six becomes 28. And then if the bag increased one more size, we can get an item number one, which brings us to 29. And if the bag increased another size, that doesn't help us, so we stay at 29. <coughs> when the bag eventually reaches size 11, and we're using the first four items, we can do 22 <coughs> plus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 22 plus 18 gives us 40. So using the first four items, the best thing to do to hit 40 is to use item 3 and 4. That's the best way to fill up a bag of size 11 when we get to use the first four items only. Now we just want to calculate the last row to get to the final answer to this question. And we copy these. This is 7, so it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. These get directly copied. And now we consider adding this item. We can add it and get a value of 28, so 28 beats 24. So if the bag was size 7, you would take just this item and don't take any of these. <coughs> if the bag increases by one pound, you would add this. The first one gets us to 29. If the bag goes to 9, we get 28 plus uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 28 plus 6 is 34. If the bag then increases to size 10, the best thing we would do is take item 5. We would take item 5. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. We would take item 5 and then 2 and 1 if the bag was of size 10. We would take item 5, then 2 and 1, which is what the greedy algorithm gave us. If the bag then increases to size 11, we say to ourselves, do we want 28 plus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7? Do we want 28 plus 7, which is 35, or do we want to not use this item and use the best answer we had using the previous four items, which was 40? And in that case, when the bag hits size 11, not using this item becomes smarter. We'd rather use the best answer we can get when we don't use this item, the best we can do of these four before us. So the 40 value comes from the fact that uh, item 3 and 4 add up to 40 and fit in the bag. 
So our by sight and our greedy methods do not work in this case. And obviously I, I arranged the number so that it wouldn't work. Um, you know, to make it, to show that uh, all the greedy methods, including probably the most intuitive one where you figure out the best unit price and then stuff the bag with that, that doesn't even work every time. And this is an easier example because we're only allowed to use one item of each. If we were allowed to use multiple items of each, we could use the same method. We would just have to, when we go to calculate the best thing we could do for each bag, we'd have to take into account the best answers, which come from the row before it. So it would still work, but it just, it's easier to explain this way. Okay, the last example of, um, of a dynamic programming approach uh, to get a you know, maximal answer to a question is uh, a coding mechanism called Huffman coding. So I hope, this, I hope this is visible. This is in green, just to show it's a different example. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a simple idea uh, to follow, to, and, and then you're asking yourself, can I maximize or minimize my answer by using another approach, using a greedy approach? So, for example, suppose we had to send a huge file over a network, and the file contains a bunch of letters A, B, C, D, E, or F. Those are the only letters they, uh, the only letters that we send. But there's tons and tons of them. There's like uh, 100,000 characters we're going to send. We're going to send a file with characters between A and F, but 100,000 of those characters. So we send it over to uh, a receiver, and obviously we would need to, if we're transmitting bits, we would need to um, use at least three bits to represent the letters. Maybe we could say 000 is an A, 001 is a B, 010 is a C, you know, and so on. So we would use up, using three bits, we can actually make eight unique letters, but in this case we're only using six, so two combinations actually never get used. So the receiver of our huge file, our 100 character file, is going to receive 300 bits. And they'll read them three at a time. They read the first three and they go, oh, I know what letter that is. They read the next three, oh, I know what letter that is. And they can decode the message once they receive it. So what we'd like to do is to figure out a way, could we send less bits, but still get the message across? Is there a way to do this? So suppose we observe, observed in our file that the letter A appears 45% of the time. I think this example came from that algorithms textbook, the big one with the four different authors. <clears throat> um, so suppose the A came out 45% of the time in the file, and the B came out 13% of the time, the C came out 12%, the D came out 16%, E's show up 9% of the time, and F show up 5% of the time. Is there some way that we could change what bits represent each letter so that the total number of bits we send is dramatically less. Now, um, I uh, suppose I told you that 100% of the letters were A's and the rest were uh, not A's. <laughs> is there any method you could think of then that could... You guys are quiet today. <laughs> Okay, well, if every letter was an A, we could just send, uh, we don't have to send anything. Every letter is an A. <laughs> but what if 99% uh, of the letters were A's and 1% were B, C, D, E, and F? Would it make sense to dedicate three bits to the A if it's happening 99% of the time? What we might want to do is dedicate like a 0 means A and a 1 means not A, some other letter, B or C or D or E, uh, and then let bits after that decide which one it is. This would cause 99% of our letters would take up one bit, and then uh, the remaining um, letters might take up four bits, but that's okay, like one bit to mean not an A, and then three remaining bits to figure out which one it is. So if 99% of our letter, uh, of our, of our letters took up one bit and 1% took up four bits, 
that would actually have a better average than sending three bits for everything. So with these percentages, we want to kind of take advantage of that idea that if, if one letter, let's say, showed up 50% of the time, we might want to dedicate one bit for that one, and then one bit to say it's one of the other five letters. Something like that might make sense. So what we're going to try to do is come up with a bit scheme for the letters. Um, so what we want to do is come up with a schema. Let me, um, let me just focus this a little bit. Um, so we want to come up with a schema where the more the more often a, a uh, bit shows up, the more often a letter shows up, the less bits it takes. And even if the expense means that the infrequent ones get more bits than three, maybe four bits, that would be okay because we're going to end up getting an overall benefit from it. So, what we're going to do is we're going to say out of all six letters, we're going to say, well, the E and the F, we said uh, on the last page, we said that that takes up um, the E took up, what did we say it took up? It took up 9%. 9% of the letters were E's and 5% were F's. So out of all the different percentages, we're going to combine the two lowest ones and make like a node on a tree out of it. So 5, five plus 9 is 14. So E or F shows up 14% of the time. So this box here, this is kind of an intermediate node. Boxes are intermediate nodes and circles are leaf nodes. That's what the authors decided. Um, <clears throat> so uh, E or F comes up 14% of the time. And then C's come up 12% of the time. B's come up 13% of the time. E or F, we now combine and said that comes up 14% of the time, and D's come up, I think, that was 16% of the time. So uh, now we take the two lowest out of 12, 13, 14, 16, and 45. We take the two lowest numbers, which is 12, uh, 12 and 13, and we combine them together and say, well, B or C shows up 25% of the time. So we combine B and C and we say, well, 25% of the time the letter is either B or C. 14% of the time the letter is either E or F. And D was, we said D was 16% of the time. So now, we, as we're forming these groups, we're saying E and F comes up 14% of the time. B or C comes up 25% of the time. D comes up 16% of the time. So out of 14, 16, 25, and 45, we combine the two smallest ones, the two infrequent ones. So we combine 16 plus 14, and now we say that 30% of the time, D or E or F come up. That happens 30% of the time. 25% of the time, B or C comes up. And 45% of the time, A comes up. So 45 plus 25 plus 30 equals 100% of the time. Now out of the three options, A, option 1, A, option 2, B or C, option 3, D or E or F, of those three options, which two come up the least frequent? And that would be the B and C, and the D or E or F option. So we'll combine those. Those get added together. 30% and 25% get merged together to become 55%. And A happens 45% at the time. So let me just read what this tree is saying. The tree is basically saying that if you came in through the top, so we're, we're now going to start printing out bits to tell you what letter is the next letter you're about to read. And the idea is that 45% of the time it's an A, and 55% of the time it's something that's not an A. And out of the times it becomes something that's not an A, 20, which happens 55% of the time, 25% of the time it's either B or C, 
and 30% of the time, or th 25 out of, out of the 55 is B or C, 30 out of the 55 is D or E or F. Now, if you go to the 25% the, uh, of the time where it's B or C, well, half the time is B and half the time is C. Or, or whatever, you know, the, the, next, the next hop down tells you what letter it is. But out of the 55% of the time that it's not A, 30 of those 55, it it's going to be a D or an E or an F, and we go to here. 16% of the time it's going to be the D, and 14% of the time it's going to be either E or F. And so we're, we're splitting this way. So now our goal is to say that we're going to assign the leaf nodes of this tree to be the uh, values, whether you want left or right, to get to that node. And that'll tell us what is going to be the bit code for that letter. So, for example, going left means a zero and going right means a one. Let's use that as a convention. And A could be represented by a zero bit. So when we go to read a number, we're ready to read a brand new binary number to represent A or B or C or D or E or F. If we see a zero, we know it's an A. If we see a one, we know it's not an A. It's either B or C or D or E or F. We don't know which one, we have to see more bits. So a one means this box represents B or C or D or E or F. If the next bit is a zero, so if we see a one followed by a zero, that means it's either a B or a C. The one means not A, the zero means either B or C. And then the next bit after that will tell us which one. So for example, if we saw a one, zero, zero, we know it's a C. If we see a one, zero, one, it's a B. And then just following that thought, if we see a 1, that means it's not an A. Another 1, that means it's not a B or a C, it's a D, an E, or an F. So if we see a 1, a 1, and a 1, that means it's a D. The first one means not A. The second one means either D or E or F. And the third one means D. If we see a 1, 1, 0, if, if we see a 1, a 1, and a 0, that means it's not an A, it's not a B or a C, it's not a D, which means it's either an E or an F. We need to see one more bit to figure out which one it is, and a 0 would mean F, and a, uh, a 1 would mean a D. So with this new schema, A's only take up one bit. They used to take up three, so that's a big savings, and they show up 45% of the time. That's a huge savings. With this new schema, one, one, zero, one, E's take up four bits now. They used to take up three. So now they take up four. That meant, so now we made things worse. As far as F's and E's are concerned, we made things worse. They used to take up three bits, now they take up four bits. But why does that not bother us? Because these happen so infrequently that the savings on the A's outweigh the loss on the <coughs> E and the S combined. That's why we were combining percentages. These two combined is still smaller than A, so that's why it shows up way down here. If these two combined and were as big as A, we might not get much savings out of this. This might not be a good idea to do at all. So using this schema now with A's, I don't know if you can see this, A's are zeros, B's are, B's are 1, 0, 1, C's are 1, 0, 0, you know, and fill, filling out that tree. We now can calculate how many bits to send the same exact message, and it becomes 224,000 bits instead of 300,000 bits. So we save like 75,000 bits. But now the annoying thing is the person that they re who's receiving the file, they have to know this. They have to know this picture, so they can, as the bits are coming in, they can read them and figure out what they are. So if they see a zero followed by a one, what do they do? Well, zero means A, and then one is the beginnings of the next letter. They have to read more data to figure out 
what the next letter is. So it's a little bit more of a pain on the sender and the receiver to get it into this format, but if the big transmission is a big problem for you, this could be beneficial.